Hi there. This is a special edition for our upcoming Labor Day celebration in America. Gift Biz Unwrapped, episode number 125. Sometimes you must go where your heart is. That's just what you must do. Hi, this is John Lee Dumas of Entrepreneur on Fire, and you're listening to Gift Biz Unwrapped, and now it's time to light it up. Welcome to Gift Biz Unwrapped, your source for industry-specific insights and advice to develop and grow your business. And now, here's your host, Sue Monheit. Hi there, it's Sue, and welcome to this very special edition of the Gift Biz Unwrapped podcast. Whether you own a brick and mortar shop, sell online, or are just getting started, you'll discover new insight to gain traction and to grow your business. And today, do I have a treat for you. We will be hearing from Rebecca Bloomfield of Jerry Pearlstein and Associates, but not really. You see, Rebecca has been privileged to work with the lives of famous women in American history like Abigail Adams and Lady Bird Johnson. She's also been asked by small communities to honor the lives of women who were important to their beginnings. We have the fortune today of meeting one of these women as Rebecca portrays Elizabeth Meyer. Let me introduce you to Elizabeth. She was born in the southeastern corner of Switzerland in 1818. Elizabeth had a strong desire to open her life to a new world and new ways, so she joined a Swiss Protestant group headed for Wisconsin in this land called America. She had never traveled more than a few miles from her parents' farm. She wasn't quite sure where she was going, but she took it step by step. Let's talk with Elizabeth now and hear about her remarkable journey and the life she created for herself in America. Elizabeth, welcome to the show. Well, thank you much, Sue. I'm so glad to be here, Ms. Monheit. I am honored that you have agreed to talk with us today. And this might seem a little bit silly to you, but I'd like to start off our talk by having you describe a motivational candle. So if you were to think of a candle that describes you, your life, your journey, what you've experienced, what color would your candle be and what would be a quote or a motto that has driven you your whole life? Oh, that is a very interesting question. I would think my candle would be red, like a Christmas candle, you know, bright red. I love always the holidays to be with people. Christmas is my favorite. And when I have this candle, I would be so grateful for everything that I have. And it would remind me that I got here bit by bit. You have to do it bit by bit. So your motivation has been taking bit by bit, little step after little step, and it brings you to great places. Would that be right? Great places indeed, yes. So your life is so fascinating to me and all of the people who are listening to us today. Can you start back when you were in Switzerland and what gave you the courage to leave your family and go to this unknown place called America? Well, we had a very nice life. There had been great wars on the European continent. Napoleon had gone every place and made havoc. But where I lived was not so much problem. The problem was there is only so much land. You can only divide the land up so many ways to support somebody. And then there is no land to make a new family. You must find a man who has some land to raise goats or some crops to support the family. And it got so small, and everyone was after me. Elizabeth, it's time to marry. Elizabeth, you are 16, you are 18, you are 20. It is time to marry. But I did not see around me who I would marry and how I would make a life. So I heard that there were people going to America, And one day I just decided that I would start and I would see how I could do that. Now, were other people that you knew doing the same thing or were you the only one? Oh, yes. There were some of us followers of Calvin, Protestant preacher, and they were going to 
Wisconsin in America, where there were others like us also who wanted more opportunity. And so after church one day, I had a conversation and at first they were not so pleased to take me because I was a single woman and I had quite talking to do to say I won't cause any trouble, I won't go after the husbands, you know how that is. (laughs) Were you then the youngest of the group that came over? I was the youngest single person. The others were families. They had children, so that's why I said I could help take care of the children as we went. We didn't really know how long it was going to take. Let me stop you for a second. How did you tell your parents, and what did they say? What was their reaction? My parents already thought me so headstrong. I think that they were not surprised that I would be going. And my father, he had a talk with a man who was heading the group. There were 14, maybe 15 of us. And what I would need, and I think maybe he was happy he did not have to feed me anymore. My mother, she was the one who was so upset. She did not want me to leave. Sure, because you may never see them again. Yes, that was true. And I was an other woman in the household for her, you know. But sometimes you must go where your heart is. That's just what you must do. So you were an adventurer and your heart just told you that because of the limited land that continued to be smaller and smaller and smaller, that your future couldn't be where you were raised. You had to go somewhere else. Yes, you know, you stand on the mountains and you look at the mountains, you see so far, you say there must be some more. (laughs) If these mountains are so big, this vista is so big, there must be some more. So... You decided to take the trip. You said your goodbyes. How did the trip go? The Rhine River starts from near where we were in Schweiz, in Switzerland. And it travels north to the North Sea. So we knew that this is how we would go by boat from place to place. And the head of our group already had written to some other communities of churches like followers of Calvin and what we believed in. And we would go from place to place, our group, and stop where these communities of believers like us. Do you know if the leader had a map all the way through, or did he just know from the next place? And then at the next place, you found out how to get to the following place, etc. In this part, to go from our village to Rotterdam, up on the North Sea, this we knew. But to go this way was easy. We went on flat bottom boat, we went on river boat, we went from community to community, we could get supplies. Our people took us in, they fed us, they gave us more to go on. But once we got to Rotterdam, we now had to cross the North Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. And then how far was this Wisconsin? That was a big question (laughs) to know how to do. Sure. So did everything go pretty smoothly, though, as you were traveling? Oh, my goodness. You know, each day you had to think what might happen. Would the boat go? Would the weather be good? Would the community that said they would take you really take you in? Would your money last? Would everybody stay healthy? But I loved being with so many people. I loved seeing so many new things. So the river part of our trip, I still love. I love it too because in one of these communities, I met Nicholas Meyer. And he was a man thinking like I was thinking. And there was uh, much chaos in Europe after Napoleon. No jobs, people moving around, and ideas that he did not like. So I met him in one town, and two towns later we were married. (laughs) 
Oh my word. So he wasn't part of the initial group. No. But you met him and then did he join your group to come to America? Yes, he did. Because of you. I think so. And because this is what he wanted. And he saw some courage that we had in the group. And so he packed up what money he had and sold what he could to get more money, packed up his things and came. And as we traveled soon, very soon, we were married. The man who held our group, he said, oh, no, either you get married or Nicholas has to get off the boat. <laughs> so. Oh, that's why you got married so fast, because just the culture of the day would not allow both of you to be single and be traveling together. That's right. Yes. But it was good. It was a good thing. Yes, very good. Wonderful. Okay, so continue on with the journey. So now at least you have a partner. You have someone who is now forming a family around you. You aren't even in America yet. So that had to be comforting for you. Well, it was, and I really needed him because, Susan, I am not for the sea. The North Sea was so awful. The Atlantic was so awful. I was so sick. They kept saying, you will get your sea legs. And then I thought I would get my sea legs, but I was with child, and I am sick because of this child. I am sick because of this sea. And it takes so very long, and there's no fresh food. There are all of us huddled together in this ship. And if not for Nicholas' strong arm around me, and he kept saying, one day, one day, Elizabeth, here is one day. He would say, one month now, Elizabeth. The baby is going, you are doing a good job. One month, one more day, Elizabeth. And so that is how we crossed these enormous seas. So you just took it day by day, even if you were sick, if you were cold, surely the boats were cramped, and you just looked at it day by day. Yes, and you prayed some, and you did what you knew to keep healthy and made on the ship some kind of order, some kind of routine to clean, to breathe, to exercise, to read from the Bible, just to something to get through the day that would keep you strong and make you stronger. Wow. Did everybody on the ship survive and get to America? Yes, we were lucky that that happened, that it was a good captain that we found. This was not always true for everyone, but this was an upstanding man who was the captain on the ship, and his crew liked him, and the group stayed together. There were some people who came not to like each other, and there were arguments among them. But I was able to see what was my part to in the argument or my part not in the argument and to stay out if it was not my part. Yeah, so you were looking at the bigger picture. And clearly, I can only imagine, Elizabeth, with such close quarters and all these people together and everybody anxious because it had to take such courage and such willpower. And it was uncomfortable, I'm sure. But clearly, I mean, just by human nature, there's going to be some friction. And every day I had to pray that we would reach land before my baby came. Yes. How long was the trip? Across the sea, the North Sea, and then to wait for the big boat to go, because one boat from Rotterdam to England, and then another boat we had to wait for to go from England across the Atlantic, and that took almost two months to New York. Okay, so, all right, so two months, so you land in New York. Tell me about that. Oh, my goodness. I thought Rotterdam was so many people. I thought in England were so many people. But here in New York, I never saw so many people, so many buildings. And in the distance, no mountains, just more buildings. 
and the noise all day long, all night. And so now we find wagons and we take wagons to where the Erie Canal starts. And now I know that if I'm going to be in this country, my next step is to learn English. I must learn how to speak English. For the first time, I am with people who are speaking English on this Erie Canal. You know this Erie Canal? Yes, of course. It goes to Buffalo, New York, and Newell and the men, they walk and they pull the flat bottom boat along the canal to get to, to Lake Erie along this canal. And I learned to sing Erie Canal. They sing Erie Canal. <laughs> I start learning this English. And again, I am hoping we will get to where we are going before this baby comes. I am now over halfway with this baby. And so you had no one really who was watching your health other than yourself because you didn't have access to a doctor. Would that be right? Oh, and there were other women with us. And they tell me going in the air canal, you could always get off and found a midwife. But once we get to Lake Erie and these great lakes is like being on the ocean again. And then weeks and weeks, we are going across this It is a great lake, and we come to Chicago. I do not like Chicago. (laughs) Why not? (laughs) Like mud. Everywhere is mud, and people, and I am getting so big, and now we get a wagon, and we are supposed to be going to Wisconsin. Elizabeth, what time of year was this when you got to Chicago? We had started out at the end when the river was no ice at the end of March. Whoa, so you were on the river. It was still very cold, too. Yes, the wind on the river was cold. But so we start at the end of March so that we can go up the river and cross the ocean in more summertime and get to where we need to be before another winter. I see. That was the plan. Okay. So we start out, and there is a road that comes from Chicago, and it becomes a road called the Lincoln Toll that is covered in planks, not so much mud. But I say to Nicholas, when we get to this town uh, uh, called Nile Center, I say, I cannot go anymore. I must stay here and wait until the baby is born. He says, it is just maybe days to go to Wisconsin. I say, no, Nicholas, I must stay here. And so we stay there by this part of this Lincoln Road that you must pay a toll to be on. And a man named Peter Blameiser, He had the idea to build this road for people coming from Chicago into Wisconsin, and he makes money on the toll, and he also builds many things. So Nicholas, he is very good to build things with wood. He is a strong man, and he talks to this Mr. Peter Blameiser, who tells us that we can take some trees down where the oak and the maple are that he uses for his road and for what he is building, and we can build our own cabin, and Nicholas can help us with the building. He is to make some money to now support the family, and that is where we start, in a cabin by this Lincoln Road that Mr. Peter Blumeiser has built. Wow. Okay. So now at least you are settled for at least the time being. And how shortly after that did you have your baby? Less than two months I have my baby. So I'm still on my feet when we are making this cabin. Were you helping to build the cabin also? Yeah, not with the wood or the big logs, but there is, you put this daub between the wood 
so that the wind will not come through this clay. There's much clay in the earth, which is a good thing for the cabin, not so much for making the garden. Right. <laughs> then that is the part that I did and that I made. It's summertime, so I could make some garden, some beans, and many kinds of beans. And I find blueberry bushes in this area. And there is much rabbits, but you mustn't take rabbits in the summer, so you have to wait for fall. But we are settled by the time I have my baby, our baby, our first child. And we will be in this cabin in the next years. I will have four children in this cabin before Nicholas can build us a real house. So are you telling me you never did go to Wisconsin? No, but I like this Niles. People come, they speak German. I speak Switzerland, and they speak German. They are from Mecklenburg and from Germany, and they build churches, and there is two stores, general stores, and over one of the general stores is a dance hall, and there is a market comes to town every Thursday, and so... You know, I, I love the people. I love there is always something at the church, and there is always something at the dance hall. I like this Nile Center. So you had really established the dream that you had set out for when you left your family in Switzerland. You were looking for a place in America with land where you could make a living. Along the way, <laughs> you found your husband, and now you have a family of six. Is that correct? Yes, I had thought I would have another farm, just like the farm in Schweiz, but no farm, no more than a kitchen garden and some chickens and pigs and goats. So that was not what I had planned, but to be with new people, to be in something growing, to have children and see them go to school. This is the part of my dream. I think maybe it was more important than whether it is done on a farm or in a town, a village like Nile Center. Sure. And did you do anything else in terms of having any type of a trade? Well, my trade was keeping us fed and clothed. And then, you know, I work with the church ladies and we take care of the church and we take care of charities. And it was a very busy and a full life. It sure sounds like it. Did you ever get homesick or wish you hadn't have made the journey? I could not allow myself to get homesick. If you think your heart is at home and you think you must give heart to where you are going, and if you have heart in two places, then you have a broken heart. Oh, that's very wise, Elizabeth. Well, you must keep what is your purpose. How are you going step by step, day by day is where your heart must be. What happened today that was a good step? What happened today that is your dream coming true? This is what you must do. And yes, I would do this again because where I came, so wonderful to be with Nicholas and have my family and be part of a place that is growing and changing every year. I, I like that. It's so interesting. And I think that you feel the way you do probably because you were an adventuresome spirit when you left your family. It wasn't like you already knew Nicholas and were going because he wanted to. You already had the vision. Yes, I think if I had stayed on the farm, I would have become bitter. I would be unhappy. I would do what I do, but something would always be missing. Sure, I believe that. Do you recognize how valuable and important your journey was in terms of establishing a whole nother group of people here in America? Did you see that when you were landing here and starting to build your cabin? Oh, I know from his skill, 
how important Nicholas was in the building because so many people coming, railroad coming to Nile Center right by the big general store with a dance hall on top. And all the people who come with their dreams like we did. And I can help people when they come, and Nicholas builds for them. And so I think that was important that we could do that for them. Absolutely. And how has your life continued to play out? I have four children. They have all survived, and they are healthy. And I am part of this community. And it is my dream come true to be where there is more than just a small farm and the same people every day. (laughs) Elizabeth, I would like to offer you a special gift. It's called Daring to Dream. I'd like to present you with a virtual gift. It's a magical box containing unlimited possibilities for your future. So this would be your dream or your goal that you would have right now that could almost seem unattainable, kind of like when you left Switzerland, like, will you really even make it? What would be that dream that you have now? That's what's inside this box. So if you would, open it up for us and let us know what's inside your box. Also, I would like to see what you see of Nile Center. What is the Nile Center that you see? Are the people that I knew, the Clems, the Blamices, are they still there? The children, the grandchildren? What is it like from what you can see in your time? That is what I would like to know. Oh, very interesting. Just as we're so curious about the courage that it took and everything that you did with your life, which is why I'm so grateful that you're sharing it today, it's interesting how we're all curious about other people and how they've lived, and especially women, because even though we live in different times, we're still so bonded to each other. Oh, I don't know what I would have done if it had not been for the wonderful women along the way who shared with me, you could not sit with men. You always had to have other women with you. And they were wonderful women. They were courageous women, too. And I could not have done it without the other women. Always the women must lead the women. The women must allow other women to lean on them. The women must give strength and courage. It's the women who give the strength and courage to everyone, and that was wonderful. And it's still the same today. We lean on each other for sure, and there's a strength in women, not to discount the men. They have their role for sure, but there's strength in women, and having that connection and that bond is like no other. Elizabeth, thank you so much. I appreciate your sharing your journey through this life and through this world. And I appreciate your talking about your candle, that beautiful red candle, and how bit by bit you did something that almost seemed insurmountable, being able to come from Switzerland all the way over to a community in muddy Chicago. But to let us have a little bit of insight into the strength of women of your age and what you've done for us, I so appreciate your sharing this with us. And may your journey through this world continue to burn bright. Thank you so much, Sue. All right, Gift Biz listeners, I hope you enjoyed meeting Elizabeth as much as I did. And now I would like to bring back in Rebecca so we can talk a little bit more about Elizabeth, but from Rebecca's standpoint. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Sue. How are you? (laughs) Good, 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 good. This is always so interesting to do with you. And Gift Biz listeners, you may be familiar with Rebecca. She did an episode as Abigail Adams almost a year and a half or so ago. I'll connect that up in the show notes. We also did an interview as herself, surprise, surprise, with her insurance company. And that is an excellent episode. It's part of our summer school series, and I'll also connect that in the show notes. But one of the things we talked about there was this side interest or hobby that you have in terms of researching and then portraying historical women. Tell us a little bit more about that, Rebecca. I have always been interested in history and how we got where we are. I have a very big family. 
And my family has traced their origins back to the early 1800s, and cousins have done family trees. But it always seemed to me that history is not dates. History is people making decisions. And how did they come to make those decisions? Some of the questions that you asked Elizabeth, why did you decide to go? Why did you decide to stop? Those are very personal, and they do, as you suggested it towards the end of the interview, have many times global consequences from an individual's move. So the Skokie Public Library, which is a nationally recognized library for most of the time that I've lived in Skokie, and Skokie was Niles Center until after World War II. Yeah, and Gift Biz listeners, that's about, just to give you a little perspective, it's about, I don't know, 12, 15 miles north of Chicago. Right. Its southern border is on the northern border of Chicago, and it's served by Chicago Transit. It was called Niles Center, and Niles Center Road, the road that Elizabeth talks about, is now Lincoln Avenue that runs on an angle out of Chicago from around Milwaukee Avenue, 300 North, almost in downtown Chicago, all the way up through Skokie and ends a little bit past Skokie. It had been an Indian trail, and then people sectioned it off and put down plank roads or graded it and then charged wagons to go across their section of the road. So the Skokie Public Library, and Carolyn Anthony was director of the library for the longest time, helped me work on Abigail Adams. And while I was doing that, introduced me to the Skokie Historical Society, who asked me to come to the cabin, which they were refurbishing, and be uh, living history in the cabin on certain days, and they helped me find the story. The interesting thing is that Skokie's first head of the public health, which was Louisa Clem, and she was a doctor. She became a doctor in 1896 at the University of Illinois in, in Chicago. The reason she became formed a board of health for the Nile Center area was because of the Spanish flu in 1918. People think they're just living in a little history, in a little village, in a little suburb. But there may be a lot of history to your own suburb that ties you to the place, that makes you proud that you're there, that shows you courage of people who first came, that may give you courage when you need it. Oh, that's so interesting. So what still exists? I think you were referencing just now the cabin. Is it still there? Yes, the cabin was moved so that it's next to the old firehouse, so that the grounds can be taken care of, and it's still there, and it is still open on certain days. And they have sleepovers for kids, and kids from the public schools come to it. Lincoln Avenue is still there. It still runs through what is now Skokie. The interesting thing is Elizabeth's youngest son, Samuel, built a theater near Mr. Clem's general store with a dance hall on top. He built a theater when silent movies came in because the Keystone cops who came from Keystone Avenue in Chicago came out to where the railroad was and where the general store and the market were, and they filmed there. They pretended it was the Wild West where the Keystone cops came and were chased by the train and stuff like that. So he built a theater, which is now the Skokie Theater, and that's still there in Skokie. It's been million-dollar sound system inside, and the Chicago Cabaret Coalition has taken it over, and there are programs going on now in Samuel Meyer's Theater. That is crazy to know that some of these buildings go back, you know, from the origins of the people and then the descendants of the people who came and first lived on this land, apart from American Indians, of course. Well, Gift Biz listeners, Rebecca and I decided to do this especially as a gift for you for Labor Day, just because I think 
and the majority of my listeners, of course, are women, is that, you know, there is so much courage and strength and determination and ability to succeed and make a way in this life that looking at some of the people who had challenges way different than what we have today that might have seemed insurmountable, they did. You know, Elizabeth's spirit of leaving her family, never seeing her parents again, could you imagine? And then not even knowing if you'd survive the journey, really ended up turning into a beautiful thing for her with her life, meeting her husband, having children, landing and making a life for herself in a place that she ended up loving. So think about this for yourself too. You know, some of the things that we think about with our businesses and being entrepreneurs seem like they're just out of our reach, right? But I want you to hearken back, especially on this Labor Day, to Elizabeth's story and think about what she was able to achieve. And I wish for all of us to have that same type of courage and commitment to our dream and deciding that we're just going to go, as Elizabeth was saying, and Rebecca also said the same way, bit by bit, step by step, because it is achievable for all of us. Rebecca, would you add anything else to that? I think that what you said is just wonderful. And yes, I think that you have to remember that Abigail Adams and Elizabeth Meyer didn't know how it was going to come out. We know now, but they didn't know. And so they stayed in the present and did what they needed to do in the present, always keeping in mind where they wanted to go. And that's always been a fantastic lesson for me. Wonderful point. Keeping an eye on the goal. Right clarifying for sure in your mind what you're trying to achieve and then keeping your eye on that. All right, well, we're going to wind down here, Rebecca, but do you want to just really quickly, because how could I have you provide all of this great, I'm going to say, entertainment and motivation to us through Elizabeth and not let you give a little bit of a summary of what you do with your career? So talk to us a little bit about insurance. Well, thank you. My husband, Jerry Perlstein, and I have a unique insurance agency in that my being in the creative world, I was always around people who had to get their own insurance, their own retirement plan, doing that planning themselves, and didn't have somebody who specifically would take care of them, individual family health insurance plans, the right kind of life insurance for somebody in business for themselves or in a very small partnership, and how to put together your own personal pension plan. So that's what we decided to do, and we've been doing it now for, I think, 16 years, and we love the people we work with. We started with people in the arts world, who support the arts world, and now just have 500 clients, mostly in the North Shore area, who are entrepreneurs and who inspire us every day. Thank you, Rebecca. And again, you can hear more about her business. And then also Rebecca gives some really great information about insurance overall. And heads up, insurance is not just for when you're later in life and to help people who will be here after you're gone. And she talks about why there's value to having insurance. I call it insurance while you're living, but that's all over in another episode. So you can go check that out later. All the information is going to be over on our show notes page at Gift Biz Unwrapped as usual. And Rebecca, again, I really appreciate you coming on with this special talent of yours, giving us insight and some really strong, courageous women. So thank you so much. And also to you, we've talked about your candles. You've had now three candles, kind of. Only one of them's been yours, though. (laughs) from Abigail to you and now to Elizabeth. But again, you know, I do the candle because it's the light of the future and our ability to be strong and share with others, etc. So also for you, Rebecca, may your candle and your success always burn bright. Thank you, Sue. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Gift Biz listeners, I hope you enjoyed as much as I did that interview with Elizabeth Meyer. Oh my gosh, you know, just thinking of women at that time and how courageous they had to be and all that they had to do in terms of getting themselves prepared to go into what was an unknown and putting their life at risk, really. We can be so appreciative and grateful for these women because they were so courageous and they led the way for us also to be able to build on top of what they've already done 
and move forward with our dreams. Towards that end, I have a little confession to make. I think I was remiss in not making the announcement here that the Gift Biz Builder program was open about three or four weeks ago to accept in new students. I've had a number of you ask me about the course. It has opened up and since closed already, I'm so sorry to say. So let me just tell you that the Gift Biz Builder program is a step-by-step -step course on how to start your business. So virtually from nothing, how do you decide what you're gonna do, what you're going to name it, everything all the way to should you be home-based, brick and mortar, how do you work social media, what do you do about email, how do you get customers, how do you do networking, just the complete package A to Z. If any of this is of interest to you, I don't wanna make the same mistake again. So I've set up a list that you can get on so that I can notify you when the Gift Biz Builder program reopens. If you're interested in this, I've put together a link. You just go put your name and email and then you'll get an announcement when Gift Biz Builder reopens. To get yourself on the list, just go over to bit.ly forward slash GBB notice. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash GBB notice. With that, it's a wrap, and I look forward to being together again with you next week.